taste is kind of the most emotionally uh, disappointing experiences of COVID because usually <laughs> when I'm sick, as long as I still have an appetite, I just sit on the couch and eat like yummy food. I know. And yeah. distract That's myself. Sad. Like there are two distractions when you can't do anything, TV and food. And I had the TV, but I didn't have the food and that sucked. <laughs> Oh, well. Hello, and welcome to the 538 Politics Podcast. I'm Galen Druk. I'm Nate Silver. And, and this, this is... is a mailbag po- going postal. So today, as <laughs> you mentioned, Nate, we're going to open the mailbag and answer some listener questions. We love answering listener questions, but part of the reason we're doing a mailbag episode today is because I didn't have that much time to prep. As uh, Chad mentioned on Monday, I was sick. I actually had COVID. Um, so thanks, Chad, for filling in for me. Um, it's been it's been uh, it's been interesting, kind of. Actually getting COVID after two years of, you know, rewiring our society because of it, it's almost like meeting some kind of infamous celebrity or something. I had a, a breakthrough back in the late summer. Oh, you did? Yeah. I think people should destigmatize getting COVID because um, probably more than the country, not based on the official number of diagnosed cases, but like probably more than the country, half the country has had it. A lot of people are going to get it including vaccinated people with Omicron, most likely, if you're not boosted, especially. Um, and to me, it didn't really change that much. But, you know, I think there could be, like, better guidance on when you can exit quarantine, on how to talk to contacts you had that had COVID. Um, you know, I was very grateful that there were these at-home tests because my case was very mild, could have been missed, or could have gone around for a couple of days, and then, oh, okay, I'll get tested. But instead, I could get myself tested in the middle of the night and not have to put anyone at risk who wasn't necessary. So people should be open about this and, and not terrified of having a, a breakthrough because it will happen to a lot of people. Yeah, I'll say, you know, I have been living my life basically as normal since I was vaccinated back in the spring. And so once I, you know, found out that breakthrough cases were a thing, I you know, I didn't try to really avoid it. I just assumed that if they were possible, it may happen at some point because I'm, you know going to bars and restaurants and concerts and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, and so in some ways I was surprised it took this long uh, to, to get it, but I did have an, you know, I did have real symptoms. I had a fever. I had, uh, you know, aches and a cough and lost my sense of taste and smell, which is not fully back yet. Um, but, uh, you know, it's uh I would say I was properly sick for four or five days. I've definitely had worse cold or flu experiences in my life than this. I am vaccinated, obviously, so that was fortunate that I got it once I was vaccinated. Um, but, uh, yeah, I didn't know that you had a breakthrough case, actually, Nate. I mean, I, you know, I've kind of mentioned it offhandedly once or time or twice on social media, but, like, I had kind of the opposite end where I guess your case would be mild, too, right, where, like, it was hard to distinguish from a lot of like false alarms I'd had in the past. And I too be able to feel that it's important to live your life. Um, but I do tend to get tested a lot and it was hard to distinguish the sexual case from a lot of kind of colds and allergies that I'd had. Anyway, Nate, we are here for a reason. We have a mailbag episode to do, but we're actually going to start with a variation of one of our favorite questions. So today's question is good use of data or bad use of data. The Washington Post recently published an opinion piece by Dana Milbank titled, quote, the media treats Biden as bad or worse than Trump. Here's proof, end quote. In the piece, Milbank describes conducting a sentiment analysis of more than 200,000 articles with the data analytics company Fiscal Note. They determined that while Biden had a couple early months of slightly positive coverage at the beginning of his presidency, that dropped off in July and has been about as negative or more so than coverage of Trump in 2020. Milbank writes, quote, we need a skeptical, independent press, but how about being partisans for democracy? The country is in an existential struggle between self-governance and an authoritarian alternative, and we in the news media collectively have given equal, if not slightly more favorable treatment to the authoritarians. So kind of this 
big data analysis, seemingly this pretty you know, dramatic conclusion. Is this a good use of data or a bad use of data? It's both terrible data and a terrible use of data. All the right. algorithm that Dive Nobank in. is describing is incompetent and he did real malpractice by taking it seriously. Okay, so we gotta unpack that. Let's start with the data set. Why is that a bad data set to be using? So this uses something called sentiment analysis, which is um, a uh, algorithm that tries to uh, figure out if language is positively or negatively toned based on analyzing words and where they appear in sentences, right? Um, so in theory, if I said, Galen, you're the worst podcast host in America, right? That's then, not a very nice thing to say while I still have COVID, mate. Okay, well, that would, that would a, <laughs> a good sentiment now card. algorithm <laughs> would pick up the fact that this is a negative sentiment, right? Mm -hmm. um, if I said, Galen, let me think about a sentence here. Galen, um, you know, sounds like your COVID case is not the worst, and I'm really happy to have you on the program. A bad algorithm might still detect the word worst and Galen, and because language is subtle, and not understand that it's actually like a moderately positive or at least neutral sentiment, right? Mm -hmm. um, this particular sentiment analysis algorithm is one of the most incompetent uses of data I've ever seen. Um, so let me give you the story. There are 43,223 Biden stories that this algorithm classified. Mm -hmm. And again, we want to blame the algorithm itself. We want to blame the people who made this algorithm, right? It's not the algorithm's fault that its designer was an idiot. Um, you know, the most positive story out of 40 some thousand for Biden is entitled Biden tax plans, colon, higher taxes for more spending. This is an article from the Washington Examiner, which is a right leaning publication. Um, and so that's and just positive actually, because it has like higher and more? Higher and more, right? So any human being reading this article would probably say it's a Washington Examiner, it's a mildly snarky and sarcastic negative take, right? But instead this is a, a, a judge to be the most positive story out of 43,000 in the past year, right? Um, the most negative story is something from Reuters, usually very neutral, which says pharma shares real after Biden backs COVID-19 vaccine IP waiver, right? So there are probably a lot of words like, well, real, right? Or fall, you're talking about Pfizer shares or Moderna shares falling, right? And Biden somewhere in there, but like, it's not critical of Biden at all. In fact, you know, a lot of people supported backing this IP waiver to make it easier for other companies to manufacture vaccines. Um, so, and again, this is not me cherry picking stuff. It's like literally the highest rated and lowest rated story um, that uh, that the algorithm identified, right? Clearly, this is not a competently designed um, set of code. Is there a way to use sentiment analysis responsibly or accurately in order to try to answer this question? I mean, if you gave me a month, I come up with something better than this, the algorithm, right? Um, but I think it is hard because uh, language is subtle, political language in particular is subtle. If I were trying to classify whether a story is negative or positive, probably a better way to do it would actually be to go through by panned because like, again, language is subtle and like, um, and so I'm not sure you can automate something all that well. It's probably more useful for when you don't need to be very precise about something. Maybe you're, um, maybe you're combing through like, a lot of replies from customers and trying to figure out how they're reacting and you don't have to like try to make these bold grand claims you just kind of have like some like very broad directional sense um but no this is like kind of when the phrase garbage in garbage out is used it's used to describe algorithms like this um it's it should not have been taken seriously by a national political columnist so you said that the data itself was bad, but that also the use of data was bad. So we've yeah. established why this database might be bad. Why was the use of this data bad? Say, I mean, say you did have maybe a more accurate database. Because you have to have a better detector than data Milbank had, right? It proves absolutely nothing about his point. And he took this as like kind of proving his thesis. I mean, I'm sensitive about this stuff because we work 
really hard on the analyses that we put out and we're aware that sometimes they're flawed. Um, but the last thing you want is for someone to say, oh, here's what the science proves. Here's what the numbers prove. You have to understand kind of what goes into that and what's actually happening. And if he had looked at this chart, and to his credit, the company that did this did kind of publish this data that I was able to download and look at, right? If he had spent two minutes looking at this, then he would not have used this as a serious source, right? It just kind of jumps out. Like, and by the way, his broader point about like, well, um, the media should be uh, a more on the ball when it comes to describing threats to democracy. By the way, there are some 538 stories in here, including one by, um, by uh, our former colleague, Perry Bacon. Um, and the story is titled, Five Ways Trump and GOP Officials Are Undermining the Election Process. So this is exactly the kind of story that, like, Milbank thinks there should be more of. Um, and that's coded neutrally. It's not coded as an anti-Trump story. It's about as neutral as it gets um, because, A, the sentiment analysis is not picking up what he wants. B, because it's a fair story that describes the very real threats that exist, right? But it's not using a sanctimonious tone. It's not throwing in a lot of adjectives um, that are unnecessary. And so, like, I don't know. It's, it's one of the worst uses of data in the mainstream media that I've seen in a long time. And... You know, let me add something else, too, and we can get into a larger discussion about this or not. I'm especially worried when people use data to confirm their priors, right? Um, there is complaints now from liberals. And again, I'm someone who has, there's a lot of media criticism in my Twitter feed. There's a lot of media criticism on this show and articles I write for 538, right? Um, I'm not above criticizing the media, and it's not coming from necessarily like the way that like... Um, Someone on the right wing might criticize the media. I mean, I think the media handled, for example, Hillary Clinton's emails in 2016 in a really terrible way that may even have been enough to influence the election. Um, but, like, the mainstream media does not have an anti-liberal bias. You need an intervention if you think that's the way that the wind generally blows. Um, it has lots of conflicting biases that sometimes result in stories being kind of framed in a way that... Um, that I think is mistaken. Um, I mean, the media has like a lot of legacy notions of kind of both sidesism, which does show up sometimes. Um, but overall, nearly everybody who works in high prestige media is liberal or at least moderate. The audience is liberal or moderate, right? The editors are liberal or moderate. Um, on social media, there is a lot of um, amplification of more liberal framings, um, and journalists are very concerned about social media. Um, the media does not have a conservative bias, at least the mainstream media doesn't. And I say that as someone who is a practitioner in this industry, um, you know, that's not the overall directionality of it. And, you know, one thing I noticed in the time I've been in the media, in the political media, um, I've noticed that, number one, the liberals complain more and more about media bias. And number two, the media, the mainstream media is coming closer to having like an explicit um, an explicit left-wing bias in a lot of stories it covers. Not others. I mean, there, there are conflicting biases. There are biases often toward, um, like, white male points of view, right? Sometimes there are biases toward um, toward what the audience or the advertiser might want. It's, it's complicated. And you do have individual instances of stories or topics where there is a, a bias that is disadvantageous to Democrats. How would we go about trying to discern whether or not the media is being fair or proportional in its coverage of a presidential administration? You would try to do some... Comp I mean, it's hard, right? Because the question is like, so first of all, if there is a negative frame toward Biden or Trump, it can partly be because things are going badly, right? If you have um, COVID cases rising, then the question of how much blame you'd assign to Biden or Trump for that is a complicated question, right? Or inflation or a... Um, pull out in Afghanistan or whatever, right? Um, so, you know, first of all, like, and this is the other complaint too, conservatives used to complain, oh my gosh, you know, 80% of stories are negative toward Trump in the mainstream media. Well, I think personally that like, there was a lot of reason for that. It didn't necessarily have to do with bias because like, there were a lot of mistakes that were made during the Trump White House, right? Um, so it requires like, it's not something you can do with an algorithm. I'll, I'll put it like that. Um, so this is just not know, a job for a use of data. Unless you have some very specific hypothesis that you're testing, right? Um, you know, people will point out now, well, look at the story on job creation and, like, um, 
and there was some month where uh, there were 20,000 or 200,000 uh, non-farm payroll jobs added, and people were like, well, look at this AP headline versus this other headline um, during the Trump era, and in the Trump era, this was framed as a positive, and for Biden, it was framed as a negative. Well, the reason for that is that there are expectations for how many jobs will be created, and in the Biden case, it was a month where there were supposed to be 700,000, it turned into 200,000, and for Trump, it was higher than expected, and so that's the reason why, right? And so, I don't know, it's just like, look, uh, media criticism is a, again, something which <laughs> I've been doing for a long time before it was cool. Um, I mean, and, I think it's always been cool. But, uh, but again, one thing you can look, you, you know, you can look at like, what is the political orientation of people who do high prestige journalism, right? Journalists at most shops are not supposed to make campaign contributions, but, um, but you know, when they do, it's almost always toward, um, toward Democrats or liberal causes, right? You can look at like the educational levels as, as journalism becomes more and more of a, a profession of the elite, you know, highly educated coastal people working in knowledge industries are, are, are very, very, very often liberals or Democrats anyway. Um, and it's kind of a sign of like, of how much of a bubble you're in that you think that like, oh, the only reason Biden's in trouble is because like, is because the media is framing all these stories in a negative way. Like you have to get out of your bubble and talk to like normal people. One question I do have, Nate, is the difference between what the media environment is like for a Republican administration versus a Democratic administration today. Because the mainstream press does not align itself with a Democratic administration in the same way that the right-wing press does. And so perhaps when the mainstream press covers a Democratic president negatively, for example, for the way that it withdrew from Afghanistan or on the issue of inflation or something like that, there isn't a very large left-wing flank within the media that's kind of unflinchingly defending um, whatever Democratic administration there may be in the same way that the right-wing media ecosphere may. And so I'm wondering if when you measure this all as a result, during a, during a Democratic administration's worst days, there just isn't the same kind of like neutralizing or positive spin force that there might be for a Republican White House. That's maybe just a hypothesis in terms of how these, you know, looking at how these numbers broke down, because you do see that according to this well bad use of data, things did get really negative when uh, Biden pulled out of Afghanistan. I think it's less explicit um but i think it's there in you know how stories are framed you know stories about like kind of um crime for example often have a, a frame that kind of downplays it relative to how the average voter might think for example i mean again you could go through kind of story by story and topic by topic but like but you know to a first approximation the mainstream media has a liberal bias mm -hmm. now it also has lots of other biases that often contradict that liberal bias, right? Um, or at least make it more complicated. Um, but like, but like, you know, it has a mild liberal bias, and kind of the counter to that is that the smaller, non-mainstream uh, media outlet have an explicit right-wing bias, right? So maybe it's you know, if there's any world in which this algorithm is right, maybe it's because you have some stories that are very, very biased toward the right, but the average media outlet is somewhat biased toward the left. Um, mm -hmm. It's almost like in polling, right? We have these polling firms that like have this very strong Republican lean, but then the average poll from a mainstream outlet actually has a slight Democratic lean relative to what the actual results have been, right? And you kind of put them all on the average and it kind of all averages out. Now, again, we're now in a world now where things are subscription and audience driven and the audience for kind of high prestige journalism has certain political proclivities um, and those tend to lean left. I mean, you also have... Um, people arguing kind of more explicitly that like the media should kind of have a thumb on the scale for like, I mean, I, I, I know we should talk about this kind of broader point about like, um, well, the media should be partisan for democracy. Right. Um, like, I don't know what that means. Like I'm pro democracy, just like I'm anti cancer. If I'm writing a story about cancer, then I'm rooting against cancer and I'm rooting for democracy. Right. And I think what Republicans are doing is extremely threatening and serious, but like, how does that play out in actuality? Um, like Ross, is it Doubthat or Doothat? I don't know how to say his name. Um, the kind of center-right 
New York Times columnist had a, a hypothetical saying, so we have this election now between a Brian Kemp, the governor of Georgia, and David Perdue. Um, Perdue has uh, been endorsed by Trump. Perdue is saying, I don't think what happened in Georgia was legitimate. So Brian Kemp, although very conservative, um, is kind of the pro-democracy alternative and Purdue is the anti-democracy alternative. And this could have real consequences for, frankly, how the 2024 election is uh, contested, if there is another close race in Georgia in 2024, if the votes get approved, right? Um, if there is some big scandal involving Brian Kemp, um, is the media now supposed to bury that scandal because it could threaten democracy if it reports on that? I mean, I don't know. That's not the way I was taught, right? That wasn't, you know, how I believe journalists should behave, even though I'm very pro-democracy, right? And I think these threats are very serious. Um, so I don't know what it really means. I think that's the underlying question here in what Milbank writes outside of the data set that he's using is, does covering the Republican Party's anti-democratic tendencies responsibly mean covering Biden differently? You know, if you look at perceptions <clears throat> of the media, the media is perceived very poorly, including by um, independents, right? So it's like not even as though you have this like um, this super majority of people who who like how the media covers the news, right? Um, you know, I think when you put a lot of um, invective in stories, I think people have a good intuitive sense for like when a journalist. I mean, an agenda isn't quite the term I'm looking for. Um, I think the audience responds positively to stories that make that make an effort to be fair mm -hmm. um, and to be accurate. And if you're describing threats to democracy, then the fair and accurate thing to say is that there are big problems that the country has, and they originate with the Republican Party. That's fair and accurate, right? But it isn't for every story the case that Republicans are uniquely the problem, and that and that Biden is doing his best and has like you know is getting unlucky. I mean, you have to like. Um, take them as they come, right? And I'll sound like Chief Justice John Roberts, but, you know, I think the media's job is to, like, call balls and strikes. And that's traditional, and I'll probably be canceled for it, and I don't care, but, like... But, I don't like, think anyone's going to gonna me, cancel you for that name. <laughs> you never know. But, like, but there's more and more an expectation in liberal circles that it's the job of the media to advance the progressive narrative. That's more and more... It's sometimes implicit. It's sometimes explicit. Um... But the idea that like that like oh it's just the media's job to report on what's going on and when things are going badly it needs to soberly report that and describe the potential scope of the threats that the country faces right like that view is becoming like like old fashioned and the critiques are no longer very selective right again I think like um, how the media handled Clinton's emails was terrible I mean Afghanistan is a case where um, I think there was some basis for a complaint right but like. The notion that, like, the media is trumping up inflation, it's, like, literally, literally the most visible thing possible, right? If you go to the gas station or drive by a gas station or you go to, like, the store, you literally see higher prices and you encounter them many times a day. So it's, like, the canonical example of something that is not just media hype and there's, like, long history of um, voters responding to inflation and voters caring about that and it kind of making it harder to do financial planning and so forth. Um, so if you think the media is like biased because of inflation, then you're spending way too much time on Twitter and you're in a bubble and you need an intervention. All right. So I think it is fair to say, Nate, that you think that this is a bad use of data. Do I have that right? Or or were you were you going to say a good use of data? No, it's a bad, it's a terrible <laughs> use of data. Maybe the worst ever on this segment, I think. Superlative in one way or another. Um <laughs> Let's move on and answer some of our listener questions. All right, we got lots of questions from listeners, some some more wonky ones, some more straightforward ones. The first one is about polling. This question is, how useful would a poll that asks people to rate their percentage of approval of the president be over the binary, 100% approve or 0% approve, that is currently the norm? Would that show a more accurate picture of what the population thinks about the current job being done? So essentially, instead of saying, do you approve or disapprove of the president, you would ask on a scale from 0 to 100 or 0 to 10 or whatever, how much you approve of the job the president is doing. 
what set you to that name? So there is a version of this, which is that many polls will ask whether you strongly or somewhat approve or disapprove of a president's performance. Um, that's probably about as much fidelity as you want, right? You go on like the zero to 100 scale and like people may interpret that differently. You know, my 80, maybe your 70 or 60 or whatever else. Um, great inflation, baby. Great inflation. It's like on Yelp, you know, four out of five stars is average or an Uber. If like someone like misses a traffic signal, I don't want to get them fired. You know, so I'm going to give them five stars anyway. If you look at those polls now, by the way, then they're kind of even worse for Biden. The headline numbers, there's a lot more strongly disapproved than strongly approved, um, which is also true for Trump, by the way. Um, so that's useful, but I think you probably don't really want to go more precise than that. Next question. What explains Vice President Harris's low approval numbers? Is it normal for the vice president to trail the president? And I should say we track both Biden and Harris's approval ratings on our website. And at the moment, Harris is about net negative 12. Biden is about net negative nine. So she is trailing by about three points. Usually vice presidents are relatively popular, neutral to popular. So it is a bit um, unusual, her numbers. And this gets to be like a, this is a complicated story, right? You know, we've never had... um, a woman president or vice president before. <laughs> the person who came closest, Hillary Clinton, had a lot of trouble with public perceptions. And so I think we have to um, consider this in the context of Vice President Harris's race and gender, and that can affect things. Her media coverage is pretty negative in a way that, you know, since we already have kind of like a, you know, friends getting beers conver- or vibe this conversation, Galen, you yeah. know, I do like. Friends getting COVID, friends getting beers. Friends getting COVID. It doesn't seem like the White House is doing as much as it could to, like, help Harris. I mean, she's given, like, a fairly difficult set of, like, um, of, uh, of platforms that she's handling and agenda items, right? It doesn't seem like the quotes of her are that supportive. They're kind of perfunctory in a way. Um, you know, okay, additional context. Uh, Harris, although like Biden, actually, in 2008 and 1988, um, ran a pretty spectacularly failed primary campaign. I mean, she was someone who we considered, along with Biden and one or two others, considered to be a front runner. And her campaign didn't even make it to Iowa. Um, And so it may just be that this is a a political brand that, for whatever reason, and again, this can involve her race and gender, um, that voters don't like. She has not won a lot of tough races, historically. She comes from a very blue state. So again, I don't want to get into all the reasons, but like I think she is just someone who is A, not that well liked by voters, B, tends to get bad media coverage and tends not to be that media savvy, and C, like Democratic elites, let me put it like this, right? Don't seem to be really going out on a limb to support her. Yeah, I mean, there's a real chance that like Joe Biden will not be the nominee in 2024 because of his age. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, Elephant in the room. By real chance, what does real chance mean in Nate's world of numbers? Let me go to the Scottish teens for some advice. Ooh, we haven't checked in on those Scottish teens in a while. Addendum here. Scottish teens means betting markets. Betting markets. Yeah. Scottish teens. I don't know. I actually am not sure where that originated from. But like, according to the Scottish teenagers who bet on betting markets, um, there's only a 35% chance that Biden is a Democratic nominee in 2024. That seems a little low to me, but, you know, round up and say it's kind of 50-50 or thereabouts. So you have basically an invisible primary, or we usually know that term taking place, where elites are lining up behind different candidates based on who they think will be the best president or the most electable. Um, And so you have, unlike in most first terms, where there's a presumed second term that's taken for granted, there is not that this time. And so therefore, you have an invisible primary going on, and Harris is not particularly well liked by democratic elites based on their body language. I don't talk to these people, right? But based on the fact that like there aren't a lot of supportive states. By body language you mean like, the you mean the quotes that they give to Politico. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean it's pretty explicit. And by the way, in twenty twenty, Harris, despite having all the trappings of like an establishment front runner and someone who could unify different parts of the coalition, also did not get that many endorsements outside the state of California. I think there was no non Californian senator or governor who endorsed her despite her being kind of this big juggernaut candidacy, right? So you have mainstream liberal elites kind of 
at best lukewarmly supporting Harris, maybe kind of trying to undermine her. Meanwhile, Republicans aren't going to like her because she's a Democrat, right? Um, you know, and you have the burden of being the first woman uh, person of color vice president, and so there are a lot of factors that that work together to make um, to make her popularity a difficult proposition. All right, let's move on to the next question, also about polling. It's a really wonky one. I'm going to read, there are, I think, honestly, 10 questions within this one question. I'm going to read all of them just because it's kind of fun, and we'll see what we're able to make of all of this. So Oren asks, what would it cost to, quote unquote, fix polling? And if we had significantly better polling, how would that impact the world? So this listener goes on to write, pretend Elon Musk got tired of building rockets and fast cars and instead decided he was much more personally motivated by making sure that polling was way, way better. Thank you preemptively, Elon. How much would he have to spend to make polling two times as good or maybe even 10 times as good? Maybe his goal is to make polling as accurate as the general public's unrealistic current expectations. Would it be 100 million a year, more, less? How much is even spent on polling right now? Okay, that's one question. Next next chunk of question. If polling was way more accurate, would it improve, reduce, not affect at all the average voters' trust in democracy? Would there be some unexpected public good as a result? Would very accurate issue polling revolutionize how decisions are made? Would news across the board be way more valuable and accurate? Would it be a good investment? Would all the mystery and magic in life disappear? Uh, okay. So, as promised, maybe there are even more than 10 questions in that question. The crux of this being, is there an amount of money you could spend or some massive project you could embark on that would significantly improve polling, and what might that be? I would just point to the census. It's super expensive, but it it actually is able to track people down. Um, maybe that's one idea. And then the other thing is, if we did have super accurate polling, how would that change the world? Nate, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, the census is an example where you have a very high response rate um, because it's done by mail, which actually gets a pretty good response. Um, and you have people who go and track down people who did not respond initially. So if you were really determined to reach everybody, then you'd do a team, and Galen, you'd be assigned my case, and I don't respond to the mail, I don't respond to the phone calls. So you got to show up at your door, Nate. Knock on my apartment door, and you're like, who are you voting for? Kamala Harris or Dr. Oz? Um, <laughs> <laughs> can't respond, right? The problem with that is that you couldn't really do that in a, in a timely fashion. Um, so, yeah, you can do very accurate polling if you're willing to, like, just invest a ton of money, almost like contact tracing, where you, like, reach everybody you can. Um, but the turnaround time is going to be pretty slow for that. Um, so that's that's, I think, more of the more of the barrier. How much would it help? I mean, certainly like, you know, again, we are sort of a democracy in the United States, right? Um, I'm someone who believes that elected officials should be responsible to um, to public opinion in some context. And if you can't measure that accurate, then it, it, it worsens the democracy, I think, in in some ways. So I think there is a lot of value to it. Um, but yeah, maybe we need like, you know, there's like slow food movement, maybe we need like a slow polling movement. Um, to do highly accurate polling that, like, and there are, you know, big institutional surveys that kind of get at this, right? Yes, yeah, like, CNN is changing a little yeah. bit to do a more slow polling, a slow and quick polling approach where they do these larger surveys that they use as benchmarks for some of their faster turnaround surveys. Yeah, and, and that, you know, I think I was a little snarky about that when we were talking about that because it won't be very fast. But, like, yeah, that might be the right hybrid approach, right? Um, slower polling on things that are less urgent. And then there are probably a lot of limits to how accurately you can like reach people in a three or four day long survey about like a presidential race, for example. And I mean, the main question here is would all the mystery and magic in life disappear? Yes. That's the disadvantage. <laughs> that's the, that's you have accurate polling, downside. but like it ruins, it ruins any excitement in life. So. Uh, I mean, if you had fully accurate polling, I guess maybe you don't even you don't even need an election. You don't even need us. What would we do if polling was a hundred percent accurate? Uh, invest in NFTs, man. What NFTs are on your list of NFTs to buy? Frankly, I, Martha I Stewart's are at the top of my list. I don't have an NFT list. I have to I have to say, although I am kind of getting more into. I mean, this is a whole other 
a whole other thing, man. Are you becoming a crypto like, bro? You were in Miami this past weekend, right? I was at some, uh, I was figuring something about a book a little bit. No, I think the blockchain and Web3 are something that like political elites will be thinking about a lot more in, um, in the near future. You heard it here first, folks. The, pl- the blockchain is a future political issue. Um, I would have more to say in response to that if I understood what the blockchain was. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like the barrier, and I'm like kind of on this very steep part of the learning curve. You know, it does get kind of stereotyped as, oh, who are all these weird bros paying $300,000 for like JPEGs, right? And it's like the implications are a lot more serious than that, where you have um, a means of exchange that's like not backed by a central government and is now a pretty large asset class. It's like it's potentially pretty disruptive technology in a lot of ways. Are you investing in crypto, Nate? Very little, but I may in the future. I think it's like a good, you know, it's big enough where like um, if you are trying to to invest and have different assets. I mean, again, we can talk about this in, in a couple of months when I've kind of spent more time um, researching the space, right? In part because I am a little bearish on <laughs> Western democracy <laughs> and the ability of like, Oh my God, you know, we, are you becoming one of those billionaires who's like <laughs> buying up ranches in New Zealand and preparing for the end of days. Oh no, you already said you're preparing for the end of days by scouting out some location on the beach in Lima, Peru. We we're back to we're back to a well-trod theme. Um well, uh think of me when the world is ending and you're on your your beach paradise in Lima. I'll still be in the studio apartment in Manhattan. Send me a jet. Good. Um, I'll send you a jet via the blockchain. Via yeah. the blockchain. Can I get to Lima, Peru via the blockchain? Unfortunately not. Ugh, you can't, so it costs all this money and you can't even live in it? I don't even, I mean, what, what yeah. good is that? I, I don't know, man. Yeah. Um, by the way, I, I looked up uh, how much the census cost to answer this listener's question. And the census cost uh, $14.2 billion. So that's, that's how much it cost. Fourteen point two billion dollars. Yes. All right. Well, I mean, Elon. I mean, let's kind of let's do it. Let's do it, man. Elon, give us a call. Okay. Next question. Nick asks: If large bills composed of mostly popular provisions are usually unpopular, why don't legislators simply pass each provision individually as its own bill? Would small bills with a single, easy to articulate purpose be more popular? What a hack! I think the reason this isn't being done in part is because of reconciliation and Democrats only have so many chances to use that maneuver in order to pass the legislation they want. But in a hypothetical world where Democrats had 60 Senate seats, would that be more popular if they just passed everything individually? I don't have a strong opinion about this. I mean, um, in theory, one reason to lump things together is that you would take some unpopular things and kind of uh, stick them inside alongside these, these popular things. You can kind of do it all at once, right? That's one reason for it, apart from reconciliation. I mean, I think there's a broader message about maybe the White House's messaging has not been very focused, right? Um, I don't think the average American has any idea what's really in Build Back Better, for example. Um, so, you know, um, although again, I am kind of suspicious of like, for that reason, like, oh, the individual provisions are popular, therefore the bill is popular? I'm not sure it's necessarily true. You mean you don't think the individual provisions are popular? Or you just think, of course, individual provisions being popular doesn't mean the whole bill is popular. We have so many examples of that in history. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of examples of that. I mean, you know, if you give people the price tag, right? Um, also, people haven't necessarily thought about the provisions and how they'd be executed and kind of what they would, what they would cost, right? So the idea that, like, oh, you kind of mentioned this bill and then it's not that popular, but you mentioned the provisions and they're popular when the public's more informed. I mean, the public doesn't really kind of know the details of these provisions anyway, right? So if you really, really explain them in detail and required everybody, maybe the Elon Musk polling company is paying everybody $1,000 an hour to like read detailed descriptions of everything and build back better, right? So they're highly informed. You know, I don't know how that would poll necessarily and the cost and like read opinions about like what effect this will have on different things going forward. Um, so, so yeah. Okay. So you say the answer to this question is, I don't know. 
That's okay. Sometimes we don't know the answer yeah. to your questions. I, yeah, for sure. Uh, next question. There's been a lot of discussion about the decline of swing voters. Has there been any recent polling asking people when the last time they voted for the other party is? I'm curious to what extent political coalitions are hardening versus changes canceling out on both sides. It's an interesting question. Like, both were supposed to be experiencing this realignment where part of the Obama-Clinton coalition or whatever is moving towards the right. Um, at the same time, you know, the, there are these, these new suburban Democrats, at least over the past five years or so. So are we losing swing voters? Are the coalitions changing? Yeah, what's the answer? I mean, there are definitely fewer split ticket voters than there used to be in any individual election. Do people switch parties more often? Probably less than they did too. But like, I, you know, something where... Um, we should write an article about it. It'd be fascinating to look at that. I think the numbers, I mean, there, there is more crossing over than I think sometimes the rhetoric assumes, right? And there is like a fair bit of, of canceling out. If you look at like the, um, you know, the 2008 map versus 2020, you know, both Biden and Obama won fairly um, persuasive popular vote margins, much closer to the Electoral College for Biden, obviously. Um, but the maps are actually quite different at the county level. And so over the course of um, 12 years, you've had a lot of switching, you know, maybe like a quarter of people have like, um, that voted both elections have voted differently or something like that, I'd wanna say. Um, but, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't mean they're gonna swing back <laughs> necessarily anymore. You know, if you were like a former um, uh, labor Democrat in rural Iowa and you voted for, um, for Obama somewhat enthusiastically in 08 and grudgingly because he didn't like Romney in 12 and then flip to Trump in 16 and 20, then you're probably no longer a swing voter, I don't think, um, even though you would kind of meet this metric of having voted for both parties in the last four elections. Interesting. I feel like, yeah, there's more to unco uh, unpack here. Next question is related to redistricting. While some states have formed independent bipartisan committees to combat gerrymandering, these bodies can still be problematic and devolve into partisan sparring. What are your opinions on completely removing people from the redistricting process and using an algorithm such as the shortest split line method to draw districts? I have some thoughts on this. What do you think, Nate? Um, I mean, I don't think there's intrinsically, I mean, even an algorithm is agreed upon and designed by a set of humans, and you have to decide kind of what criteria you want for this, right? So you can't like totally like, you know, an algorithm is designed, uh, uh, excuse me, an algorithm is designed or a model is designed to optimize some question, but you have to decide what to optimize it for, right? Um, so I don't know. Um, you know, again, I think um, the best way to do redistricting would be to have some uh, CISPL criteria, which are imperfect, but that put constraints on overly partisan gerrymandering and then if humans want to play within those constraints to have um, districts that look prettier or whatever then or you know protect incumbents or whatever else then that's fine but like I don't think that like um, that an algorithm per se is the is the solution right you have to have humans agree that like districts need to be representative and fair and courts agree and they and they don't agree on that right now at least in a way that like um, that will change, I don't think, in the near future in our political system. Yeah, right. The algorithm would still have to consider a set of rules, and it would still have to prioritize some rules over other rules, which is oftentimes where the debate lies. The algorithm anyway. is the easy part. In some, right? If you say, if you can agree on the rules, yeah, then maybe you say, okay, we might as well do it strictly by these rules and not have any art here, right? So it kind of solves like the last mile problem, but like, but that's not the central issue with with why. Um, gerrymandering occurs and the whole shortest split line method idea it would be almost certainly illegal right i mean when these redistricting commissions or even legislators are drawing maps they have to comply with the voting rights act and um so you know you couldn't just have an algorithm draw uh districts with the shortest lines there are certain um laws that the, that have to be followed both state level and federal you could say subject to these constraints yes yeah design an algorithm to optimize for this, right? Like, you could do that, but it's not like, uh, it's not solving the fundamental problem.
Next question is maybe a little more straightforward. What is the likelihood of a split decision in the Georgia Senate and Georgia governor's race? Are the incumbents or incumbent party more likely to hold on than the challengers? And so I think this is in reference to Governor Brian Kemp and Senator Raphael Warnock, um, both facing re-election in 2022. What's the likelihood that we see both incumbents keep their seats? So there used to be an incumbency advantage, but like it's dissipated a lot in recent years. Um, by the way, kind of to, like, to the earlier media discussion, right? Um, it may be true that the media in general is kind of more negative than it used to be toward everybody. And like, it's manifested in the fact that like, you know, statistically being an incumbent is no longer worth very much. So, um, so and for Kemp in particular, um, the fact that he's gonna get a very vigorous primary challenge uh, is probably bad news for him. It might make him more vulnerable than an ordinary incumbent. Um, I mean, there could be a split decision. I mean, I think Warnock is a quote-unquote good candidate. Um, and so, you know, you have a lot of dynamic kind of figures in that race, but, like, I don't think it's because of incumbency per se. Mm -hmm. All right, interesting. Well, that's, of course, those are two races that we're going to be tracking um, pretty intentively here at 538. So we stick around and we will find out uh, whether or not there's a split decision there. Let's ask two final questions. First one, why is there a push for Democrats to change the filibuster rules to enact legislation now when it is likely that Republicans could take over the Senate in 2022 after the 20 in the 2022 elections and then reverse those new rules? I guess this the question is, why do anything along party lines that can easily be undone in the next legislative session? Well, I mean, Biden will be president and can veto legislation, right? Um, so it's an issue for 2024 and beyond. I mean, I think the basic reason is that, like, um, is that Republicans are very unlikely to respect the filibuster anyway. Wait, why do you say that, given that they kept it intact for the four years that Trump was in office? I mean, it's not clear to me that, you know, with, like, Obamacare, they didn't have the votes for Obamacare repeal anyway, right? Um, so, you know, I think it's been true for some period of time now that if a party really wants to do something that— it would have done it and found some work around to the filibuster whether they want to or not. That might not have been true in like 08 back when, um, or 09, I should say, when like um, more of a bygone era. And I think, you know, I think Democrats were maybe naive about the filibuster back then. Um, and you had these kind of like, you know, senators from North Dakota and Montana who were Democrats. But like, um, you know, and McConnell is more of an institutionalist than a lot of people. But at this point, the ship has sailed, right? If you're going to break the filibuster for a Supreme Court nomination, then you're going to do it for, I mean, it's about as meaningful as votes get, right? Um, then you might as well do it for, for anything else. So you think it's, whether it's done during the current session, it's over, the filibuster is over in your eyes? It'll be used to the extent that um, Mitch McConnell or future leaders of the Senate want an excuse to not have to do something. You know what I mean? Oh, um, interesting. So the framing is, is all wrong. It's kind of like the votes aren't there anyway. And so the filibuster is just the excuse. It's not 100-0, but like we're moving in that direction, I think, right? And again, it's not 100-0 because like I think there are people like Joe Manchin who genuinely believe in it and in a 50-50 Senate and that who genuinely, not generally, genuinely believe in it and that can matter in a 50-50 Senate. Um, but it's eroding, I think, more and more. Final question. This is a deep one. Dylan asks, how concerned should we be about disinformation as a threat to democracy? And what, if anything, could or should be done to address the problem? We're back where we started. Information flows. Democracy. I definitely don't have an answer to the second question. I don't really know kind of um, what can or should be done about it. Um, you know, I think social media has had um, profound effects on political culture and, and most of negative. Um, but I don't know that there are intelligent ways to regulate it that doesn't make the problem worse. I mean, I feel like, as, you know, as someone who kind of is in the media, you know, I think changes in media have profound effects on political arguments and coalitions. Um, and have for like a very long time. I mean, it's like kind of literally like kind of how we like acquire information. Um, 
I don't know that disinformation is a new thing. I mean, we had kind of like a unique era that people have nostalgia for from like the 50s through the 90s where you have um, well-respected mainstream media institutions that kind of serve as gatekeepers and are making money and have high editorial standards. It's like probably not the history of like information or journalism throughout all of human history, right? Um, and that era was also an outlier in some ways as far as how relatively nonpartisan politics were. But yeah, no, for sure. I mean, the media in general has profound effects on politics. Disinformation has profound effects. And I don't really know what the hell can be done about it, even though democracy is, I think, under lots of threats. We got to end on a brighter note, Nate. So what, tell me something. What are you, uh, what are you up to? This, <laughs> what are you up to this weekend? Uh, I'm not sure about this weekend, actually. I, I'm going to uh, one more trip to Las Vegas next week to play in uh, another poker tournament. Wait, is that your but, last trip yeah. to Las Vegas for the book? No, probably not. It's the last trip this year. What are you going to do there? What's going on? What are the stakes? So there's a World Poker Tour event, which is a, a $10,000 buy-in at Bellagio. I'm going to play that. And then maybe one other smaller event after that. I have uh, played four World Poker Tour events this year and cashed in all four of them. So trying to go five for five, which is pretty Ooh. Good. All right. Well, uh, hit me up when you're back. I will, for sure. All right, let's leave it there. Thank you, Nate. Thank you, Galen. And of course, listeners, if you have any questions, you can always feel free to tweet them at us or send them to podcasts at 538.com. We didn't get to all of your questions today, but I'm sure we will get to them in the future. My name is Galen Drup. Tony Chow is in the virtual control room. Claire Bidegary Curtis is on audio editing, and Naomi Shaw is on video editing. You can get in touch by emailing us, as I mentioned, at podcasts at 538.com. You can also, of course, tweet at us with any questions or comments. If you're a fan of the show, leave us a rating or a review in the Apple Podcast Store or tell someone about us. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon.